now. So welcome everybody. So this is uh, to our side event on capacity development for agricultural innovation system, mainstreaming and, in, and investment through the tropical agriculture platform. This is a side event organized by TAP and its partners in the occasion of the FAO Science and Innovation Forum. So we will start now presenting, giving the opening, uh, hearing the opening remarks from our, the representative from the EC, Christophe Larose. So the floor is yours. Thank you. So you want me to start, I thought that. Then. Okay, so I will, I, will, I will start. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to, to be part of the opening of this, um, of this side event. Um, the European Union has been a, a sponsor of the Tropical Agriculture Platform for a number of years already. Um, and uh, what, uh, what is important for us through the support to the, to the TAP is really this uh, emphasis on innovation systems. Mm -hmm. um, because it's important to, uh, to, 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 to continue to um, develop the understanding that innovation is not only uh, a good idea uh, by someone. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's something that can happen if it is thought um, carefully within the system perspective um, and mobilizing different actors. In particular, what we have been uh, supporting uh, in the past and we continue to do so is uh, the attention to the different capacities that are needed to, uh, to make this system vision a reality. Because it's of course important to think in terms of systems, but what matters also is that it can translate through concrete actions benefiting uh, the people. So this uh, interesting work that uh, TAP has been doing uh, for a number of years on looking at the different kind of capacities uh, from the individuals to organizations, to institutions, to uh, be the framework in which innovation can, um, can happen is uh, a work that we have been uh, you know, appreciating uh, and that we still do. What we also um, see in, uh, in this kind of international initiative is that it puts a strong recognition to the importance of context-based approaches. Mm -hmm. So the importance of local innovation, but at the same time, thinking local by being able to share lessons, practices uh, at another scale, be it at regional or at global level, because we can learn certainly from local actions um, for uh, to develop a, a bigger understanding of issues at, a, at another scale. Um, we also um, value uh, the TAP thanks to, uh, to its attention to multi-actor approaches. Uh, I think that uh, still today um, there is still uh, the thinking that you know, the change will come from one actor that research as the, as the lessons to, to, to bring to everybody. Uh, but as soon as you bring uh, different kinds of actors in this innovation thinking, of course, you broaden the perspectives of each actor in this system. So at times, uh, researchers like to, to look at the agronomic performances. But at the same time, farmers will look at how it can benefit in terms of uh, economic and social aspects for themselves. So this, this ambition to, uh, to have the different kind of actors working together is certainly a way to be able to capture as much as possible the different needs of the actors 
to deliver concretely on actions. So we have been supporting the TAP through partnership with FAO um, to support country actions, but also uh, regional and global uh, initiatives. So, and I think that today we have a bit of a flavor of what these different components of the support that we have brought uh, mean concretely. So I would like to, to, to thank you for the opportunity and I will uh, end with the floor to my, uh, to my friend, uh, Sebaraj. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. And just quickly, I will give a brief overview about the Tropical Agriculture Platform and also its uh, work and function so far uh, since uh, the beginning. So, on behalf of uh, uh, FAO and also the Secretariat of the Tropical Agriculture Platform, I welcome you one and all for this uh, capacity development by cultural innovation systems, mainstreaming and uh, scaling up uh, of the tropical agriculture platform tools and methodologies. Uh, so welcome. <laughs> Just to give you a brief overview about the tropical agriculture platform, as many of you participating in this uh, panel uh, aware about this from the beginning, and uh, of course, for the participants, probably it may be uh, something new. And that is a G20 initiative established during the first meeting of uh, agricultural chief scientists in 2012 during the Mexico presidency. The main purpose of uh, the network, uh, the, the presentation mechanism, is to uh, ensure and promote greater coherence and impact of capacity development and knowledge sharing to strengthen the national agricultural innovation systems. The national agricultural innovation system that includes many different actors, as it was mentioned uh, by, by uh, Christophe. So with more than 50 partners currently, TAP is a multilateral uh, facilitation mechanism to promote greater coherence and impact of uh, capacity development programs and knowledge sharing to strengthen the agricultural innovation system in the tropics and also subtropics mainly focusing on the developing world. And this governance includes a partners assembly, a state committee consisting of about 11 members representing the different regions and also the partners, the typology of partners and also the secretariat which is posted at the FAO with uh, generous support from the European Commission for the beginning. So the TAP Partners Assembly approved the TAP action plans. Uh, currently, we are in the third action plan. The first one was between 2014 and 2017. The second uh, was between 2018 and focused on developing the <clears throat> tools and methodologies, including a common framework for capacity development and implementing them in a pilot scale to learn lessons and also package those lessons to make sure that it's relevant for scaling up. So the 2022-2025 um, action plan focuses on more on the mainstreaming of AAS approaches, tools and methodologies into the national processes, including at the policy level. Third partners, currently there are 53 of them. And most of the partners are networks of networks or networks of partners. So we have uh, all the regional research and extension organizations. They, are, they have been providing uh, great support to the TAP functioning and also producing the knowledge products, um, uh, etc. So I, I thank, I take this opportunity to thank all those partners for providing the continuous support. And that really motivates us uh, seeing that uh, what we do is really relevant for the um, farmers and also to the broader development community. 
So there are some major milestones so just for your information. Uh, the TAP uh, was launched in 2012 by a G20 Max during Mexico presidency. And uh, there was a regional uh, needs assessment task that was completed during that period. First uh, TAP partners assembly was conducted in China uh, during that period between 2012 and 2013. Then in 2014-2015, EU funds mobilized uh, for capacity development for agricultural innovation systems project that was jointly implemented by AgriNatura and also FAO. It was implemented in eight countries um, and TAP Global Task Force and Capacity Development Expert Group was launched. Capacity Development Expert Group was a, is a ad hoc, a technical group uh, drawn, members drawn from the partners, uh, providing the technical support to develop uh, the common framework and other rules and methodologies. So TAP Common Framework and the TAP EPA was developed, were developed in 2014 and 2015. 2016-2018, TAP Partners Assembly and Cross Country Learning Event in Lao, in Rwanda, and Lao, India, 2017. Common Framework and TAP EPA were approved. E Conference, Symposium, and other events to advocate capacity development for agricultural innovation system and TAP EPA. And more on the promotional side, the uh, uh, took place, both at global and regional level. Uh, 2019, 2022, until now, uh, we focus on implementation of the TAP A project initiated in nine countries. CD expert group was relaunched to relook into the TAP common framework. And uh, there was a series of discussion went to uh, until the beginning of this year. And then uh, that is transferred to an expert to consolidate all the inputs from the uh, expert group to, to revise the common framework. So collaboration among TAP partners strengthened under the EU DESERA initiative. Uh, we also collaborate with other uh, partners implementing uh, the DESERA projects. Um, so TAP uh, action plan, 2022-2025 was developed, which focuses on the scaling up. That's also closely linked to the objective of the uh, the EU-funded uh, this era project uh, focusing on. TAP action plan, there are four outcomes. Uh, innovation capacities are improved at the country level by establishing effective EAS. Uh, it's again, looking at the multi-stakeholder engagement and facilitation mechanism as a key principle underpinning our work. Uh, outcome two, regional organizations, education extension and research institutions, sorry, organizations, uh, making sure that they integrate uh, the TAP tools and methods so that they can be used as part of their regular programs and also the projects being implemented at the country level or regional level. Outcome three focuses on the entire partners and stakeholders acknowledge the importance of capacity development for EAS and advocate for more investments in the EAS for countries uh, to contribute to the G20 initiatives and alignment of the SDG of the uh, UN. So it's not just for the G20 countries, though it's a G20 initiative, but it's, it's, a, it's a, um, it focuses on wider, much wider perspective, not only for the developing world, and of course, the plant ecologically it covers tropics and tropics, but essentially it covers the every region in the world. Uh, outcome four is TAP secretary and its governance improve its capacities to achieve its mandate. So outcome four, more, mostly focusing on the functioning of the secretariat and also the governance, including the um, steering committee and also partners assembly and uh, um, uh, the working group, uh, capacity development working group, expert group on uh, different aspects. 
Coming to the TAP EAS project that is being implemented now, uh, scaling up of the TAP framework. Uh, the framework is, uh, 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 you know, the, uh, this includes the agricultural innovation system as a main framework that we use. Uh, within the framework, we promote uh, the multi-stakeholder approaches, uh, especially um, to, to strengthen the functional capacity. It's not about the technical capacity, but uh, how we can enhance the efficiency of functioning of these organizations by getting them together, by strengthening their functional capacity, like the capacity to collaborate, capacity to navigate into the complex institutional landscape at the country level and their capacity and willingness to share their experiences and to what extent these experiences can be integrated into the policy processes and then implementation. So currently this uh, project is operational, uh, being implemented in nine countries, uh, three in uh, Asia, Pakistan, Laos, Cambodia, five in Africa, Eritrea, Rwanda, Malawi, Burkina, and Senegal, and Colombia in uh, Latin America and Caribbean region. Uh, so there is a, a good uh, coherence between the previous uh, um, CDAES project, Capacity Development for Agricultural Innovation System project, and also this TAP EAES project. So there is a uh, the learnings and also experiences gained from the previous phase is fully integrated into this phase. We make sure that we move forward uh, more in the integration phase now from the piloting and learning phase in the last project. So five years uh, from 2019 to 24, 2024 implemented uh, by FAO with uh, several partners I already mentioned. Of course, FAO is taking a lead, but uh, it's not just FAO. We have so many partners working with us uh, for this uh, project. Uh, it has uh, four major components or outputs. One focuses on the TAP governance uh, that I mentioned already. The second part is focusing on country level work, uh, assessment of agricultural innovation system assessment of their capacity needs, and also conduct of the capacity development uh, um, events at the country level to the identified organizations that came from the assessment, and also uh, channelizing the experiences into the policy dialogue process. And output three is that tools and approaches are integrated into regional networks. So in which we have a close collaboration with the several of our regional partners. They are part of this panel. Thanks to one and all for uh, this very active engagement in this process. Output four is increased awareness, <laughs> knowledge on using that common framework and also combination related uh, activities of practice under the output four. So this is the uh, in that, uh, um, the introduction to the TAP uh, uh, and also the TAP project, TAP AAS project. Over to you, uh, Ilka. Uh, I, I see that Max has joined. Max, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Secretary, and very sincere apologies from my side. I will not drag the process backward, but uh, just to say welcome everyone. I don't know how I ended joining the, the, the bigger group, not the panel. And eventually when I was getting off from the bigger group, I ended in another side event. Sorry for that. But as uh, Silva said, I think from my side, I will only confirm that TAP will continue to engage with the national stakeholders and, and the regional stakeholders in terms of uh, capacity building. I, I, from where I stand from African perspective as well, uh, this is now very uh, practically seen from uh, the CADAPXP institutions. 
where we are coming together uh, as as the five institutions and 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 using the tools uh, from um, from DAP. And I think that is a very good achievement from uh, our side. And we thank uh, the European Commission for that very important support. But also secondly is to say the, the top uh, expansion and engagement strategy, uh, partnership strategy will be out soon because we, that is the, 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 the part that we need to really focus on because it helps us to see how we engage with the members, how we sustain the members, and how we add value to our members as, as staff. I'm also happy to report that uh, recently we have had expression from uh, very reputable organizations, again, joining DAP, and soon we'll be admitting them to DAP. And I, uh, that is a sign that we are progressively moving well together and tapping on their expertise and uh, resources and also what they do. I think there'll be a lot that we share. So thank you very much. And I want to hand over back to the facilitator and say thank you everybody for joining and thank you for our, uh, our, our supporters, uh, especially the EU for really uh, rallying, uh, running with us and there is, a vision, there is a way, and there is a path that we can always play at as time. Thank you very much. Ilka? Hello, yes, so they yes. will take over now with the next session, so we will have uh, facilitated discussion on regional um, experiences. So, Degi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ilka. Um, I just, okay, so just to, maybe let me stop sharing for time being. So we have, we are a bit behind the schedule, but we are scheduled to have about 30 minute discussion with the three regional organizations on, on their experience, how they integrating um, top tools to strengthen agricultural innovation systems. Together with us in our panel, I have Abdul Razak Abraham. He's a cluster leader of institutional capacity in future scenarios at the PARA, Forum for Agriculture Research in Africa. Then we have Fernando Manzo Ramos. Fernando is a full professor in the Rural Development Study Program, Studies Program at the University of Agriculture in Mexico. He's representing a Latin American Network for Rural Advisory Services here with us. Then we have Martina Spikiakova who works as a knowledge management coordinator at APARI, uh, which is at, at Asia Pacific Association of Agriculture Research Institutes. So uh, Martina, if you can turn on your camera, maybe. There we go. <laughs> so Hi, so um, idea here is that I will uh, speak very briefly, quick background on what we are doing with the regional research and extension organizations as a part of TAPIA's project. And then you will share some specific experiences from your regional insights, okay? So let me quickly share this. Um, do you see the slide share mode? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So as Salvaraju was um, saying in his presentation, no output three of TAPIA's project focuses on, on the work in regional level with the regional research and extension organizations. More specifically, we'll, we work with APAS and PARA and the, the SROs uh, and broader CADAVXP4 program framework in Africa. And then we work with Rena Ser in ICA uh, in Latin America and APIRAS in APARI um, in uh, Asia. Through this work, what we're really trying to do is integrate top 
tools and approaches into research and extension organizations and to strengthen their capacity uh, to support the innovation processes at the, at the country level in their regions. And what uh, we try to do this in a very much in synergized and coordinated way between research and extension organizations. And we really emphasize on the joint application, joint implementation and joint planning in this process. As you know, the agriculture innovation system framework is not an isolated framework and we need to come together and work in a systems perspective. I, without going into much details of what we have done so far, I want to mention a few outputs that have been um, made uh, through this uh, work by regional organizations. And um, so there has been a number of uh, many knowledge products has been produced. Seven good practice notes has been done between APIRAS and APARI last year. And then uh, we started with the joint rapid appraisal and really wonderful guide in Latin America that was uh, produced last year um, on how to strengthen the functional capacities in a very context specific manner. Uh, just mentioned few. And then uh, we have together jointly organized regional as well as global webinars and through various events and uh, as well as we organized ourselves uh, and um, trainings. There have been a number of trainings, in-person trainings and virtual trainings. And uh, one of the most significant being a training of trainers and building on training of trainers, we have uh, in a couple of regions, um, uh, initiated a community of practitioners working in this uh, field of strengthening innovation systems and capacity development. And in particularly in Africa, it's very active. <laughs> we have this WhatsApp group and continuously really exchanging information and in what's happening in the field and which is really excellent. And for in Asia, we have two working groups around regional priorities where we have regional experts discuss on how to how innovation can support that important area of work as well as regional briefs. So here is just the one picture, a few pictures of our training of trainers in each region. We have organized approximately um, 30 trainers and uh, we, we continue to work with them in our further programs. That's uh, really end of what I want to say. And the rest is really, you know, um, um, five out of six regional organizations uh, who are part of this program is here with us to tell us what they really uh, doing in terms of uh, integrating uh, and making use of really top common framework in their work in the region. Now, um, from each of you three, um, I was wondering, we can start by how top capacity development framework and approaches for innovation help overcome food system challenges in your region, no? Now we talk about food systems concept a lot uh, and uh, how do you relate top common framework to child food system challenges in your region and how do you make use of them uh, more specifically uh, in your region? What values, you know, it brings to your work. So maybe uh, we start with Martina or Mike is unmute already. So then uh, Fernando and Abdul Razak. Martina, over to you. Thank you so much, Degi. Good afternoon to everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to share our experiences uh, of a party in Asia and the Pacific. And I apologize, I have a little assistant here, so if we are interrupted, uh, my apologies. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the collaboration with APIRAS that we have. So in 2019, for the first time, uh, a, party, a party started this new partnership, really bring uh, research and extension uh, closer together and reduce the gap between them. And uh, the value that we find in this partnership is that for the first time, you know, APARI is having this regular interaction and engagement on research and extension issues, uh, and actually in response to specific issues that the agri-food systems are facing. 
So you mentioned uh, various uh, ways of uh, collaborating uh, with APIRAS, so whether it is analytical work on assessing the landscape of uh, agriculture innovation systems or various webinars where we are bringing uh, you know, different actors or multi-actors, uh, including uh, researchers and extension and rural advisors, but also collection of good practices, different surveys, but most importantly, what we are doing is really that we are mobilizing um, research and rural advisory to be part of a dialogue which is taking place at this one platform. And you already mentioned this example of uh, these multi-actor working groups that we collaborated on. Uh, that was particularly on agribiotechnology and agroecology. So by bringing these uh, stakeholders together, uh, we have been emphasizing their role in research and innovation as equal partners, which we believe is uh, very important. And also um, what also Christoph mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, this is really helping these multi-actors to recognize the value of uh, local knowledge and experience. So it's not about just you know, valuing scientific books, but really getting that tacit knowledge uh, from these multi-stakeholders. And uh, we believe that this kind of engagement is generating more trust and it also enriches innovation processes that are contributing to the creation of uh, you know, better regional innovation ecosystems. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks, Martina. Uh, Fernando? Thank you for the opportunity, Deji. Uh, well, the TAP framework is a new way of thinking for us, not the ideas and concepts themselves, but the way they are packed, considered as a whole. Actually, there is nothing new in TAP. TAP is innovative. If I may play with the words, that meant when that when we started, we recognized people have prior experiences, understandings, and knowledge on these concepts as they relate to their work. But such conceptualization was developed in a separate and individual way. So the main challenges, challenge was to help people recognize their previous knowledge so it can be blended with a new one. For that reason, we tended to emphasize knowledge management activities such as webinars, conferences, documents, and a training course. The course, the course was considered a good idea because we saw it as a way to make the vague and hard to grab, many times, content of the framework more appropriate to the characteristics of each country, characteristics that can be specific, similar, or contrasting. We thought that such particularities can be addressed and managed by enriching the course with exercises, cases, group discussions, and fora experiences. That such experiences would, uh, were related to our region singularities. Now we believe that thinking like extensionists was an appropriate and effective way to design this knowledge, knowledge management activity. When we collaborated with the, in the design uh, of the uh, Africa region course, we tried to help our colleagues using the same approach. Uh, and finally, the most important value in TAP for Relocer is that now we can be visualized in a more concrete and instrumental manner, the need for collaboration and networking, and also observe its benefits for a group of actors working as a country forum. Thank you, back to you, DG. Thanks a lot, uh, Abdel Razak. Well, thank you, thank you, DG. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with uh, everyone uh, on this panel today. So we are in FARA uh, at the capacity development, institutional capacity and future scenarios research cluster, which I lead. Uh, we definitely are very much mainstreaming the top uh, common frameworks, the tools, and the partnership it offers in terms of implementing our, our different initiatives, programs, and projects. Uh, in particular, our approach capacity uh, is around four axes. The first is about identifying what are the capacity needs of our various constituencies. Once identified, uh, those constituencies will need to prioritize them. And so the tools that we apply in first identifying those capacities and prioritizing them so that we come up with a capacity action plan are very much aligned with the top uh, common frameworks and we, we really make use of that. And the third element 
which may be indirectly related is about the capacity to plan in terms of foresight, application of foresight and food systems approach. And finally, the capacity to mainstream gender in the way that programs and projects are implemented across the, the continent. So over the years, we have really learned to navigate uh, a number of complexities, to borrow the term from, from, from TAP, you know, in implementing our various activities. And so we have seen uh, several institutions within our uh, constituencies applying the TAP as of today, you know, looking, uh, looking through our report, I see that we have up to 459 institutions that actually mainstream and apply the TAP tools, which we popularize actually, either directly from the, the FAO and the TAP uh, platform itself, or in conjunction with other uh, tools that we, we make use of. So, so there's a lot of uh, this push towards mainstreaming agricultural innovation systems and the way that programs are implemented uh, so that our various constituencies understand what is it that they need in terms of capacity, what, what are the gaps, and those capacity, those gaps not only uh, should not only be individual, but you know the holistic approach. And so the, the tools offered by TAP really provide that uh, that um, that framework that every institution can apply in bridging its institutional capacities. I, I know that maybe there will be more opportunities to talk about you know, some of the key entry points or in terms of uh, specific examples and tangible examples I can give you some of um, the questions. Thank you. Excellent. Abdul Razak, uh, did I hear correctly that uh, you counted about 90 institutions in Africa who has uh, been making use of TAP uh, tools and approaches? Yes, 459 actually. 459. Yes, 459 in our, in our records. Yeah. Wow. Well, we have, to, uh, we have to chat how you <laughs> counted, and uh, this sounds a very, uh, very, very exciting news. Uh, and also uh, need to capitalize on this uh, important findings that you have. And, and then, of course, you know, um, uh, Fernando, you were saying contextualization of this concept is so important and so critical, no? And this is where the beauty of TAP framework is that it's, it's, it can be applied in all sorts of contexts, in all sorts of um, circumstances, how, but how to communicate that in that context effectively and then make use of it is very important. Now, um, just want to, um, you know, Fernando, you mentioned about the, um, the, the work um, in Africa, the training of trains that, uh, that you have supported as well. And I want to come back to, to that, Fernando, how you see, and also Martina, you were part of the team as well, uh, supporting the training of trainers in Africa as well. And it is nice to see that, you know, we, this process facilitated not only the collaboration between the research and extension organization in the region, but it is also facilitating and um, nurturing collaboration and exchange between the regions. Um, another question I want to ask three of you also is that what, what are the key entry points for strengthening agricultural innovation system in your region? You know, common entry points, I assume there is various, but how does, you know, top features and contributes to these entry points. And Abdul Razak, you too mentioned a bit about tool versus conceptual framework. You know, there are different uses for it, but if you guys can elaborate on it uh, and maybe bring in a bit of concrete examples of how that's happening, that would be great. Okay, so I can, I can go on to say that um, we have, at least five entry points in the way that we, we advocate and advance the use of uh, TAP and the tools that, they, that it offers. 
it can be programmatic. So there are, there are specific initiatives where we really apply it. For example, I can give you an example of a, of a fellowship program that we are currently implementing. Where we're targeting the strengthening capacities of 5,000 fellows over the next um, eight years now, because we've been on the program for two years so far. So what we do is we train people, particularly academic staff in tertiary institutions across Africa, within the global south, and then we bring them back to, to their home countries and, and establish innovation platforms. So within that innovation platform, we really mainstream the agricultural innovation systems thinking in the way that they do. But we also analyze in an institutional level, what is it that is missing? What do they need to, uh, what can we do to bring about that mindset shift? Because really in Africa, in, in most cases, it's about that. It's about bringing about the mindset shift such that our, our experts and stakeholders begin to approach development problems and agricultural problems in particular with that, with that in IAS, the IAS thinking. So, so that's the first level of programmatic, then there's the institutional level. So then at country level, there are specific uh, countries that have adopted certain methodological approaches like the science agenda for agriculture in Africa within which we have embedded that idea of assessing your capacity. And then, of course, we, as you know, FARA works with the sub-regional organizations. So there are S the SROs and, and AFAS, which is uh, chairing the top at the moment. So at these various levels, we advance the agriculture innovation system that's, that's offered. It's exemplary by the tools offered by, by TAP. Thank you. Fernando and Martina, would you guys like to add to it? Martina, please. Yeah, um, yeah so I just would like to mention that uh, this joint rapid appraisal together with APIRAS in uh, 2020 identified three entry points which have now become the basis basically for our work. Uh, with TAP, and uh, these are uh, capacity development partnerships and enabling environment for innovation. So by using uh, various facilitation approaches, which uh, TAP is promoting, uh, we have been really working to strengthen these areas. And what we have learned is, first of all, is how to tell our story better. And this is to convince various you know, stakeholders, for example, researchers and scientists to integrate the innovation system perspective but also involve farmers, communities, and universities and other system actors to better address the complex issues through strategic partnerships. So this has been now recognized as fundamental for driving innovation strategies uh, that improve you know, agricultural productivity, uh, food and nutritional security and environment. But what we have also learned, and I would like to emphasize this, is to really to tell the story better to convince also policymakers, you know, why it pays off to invest in people. So we don't just talk about uh, investment in agriculture research and education, but the investment in people to really enable them to resolve some of the crucial issues that the society is facing. And this is why capacity development for innovation is, uh, is so important in our work. Um, so the need for this uh, blending of technical and functional capacities, which uh, now APARI has completely mainstreamed in, uh, in its projects and its activities, is being now increasingly recognized uh, as critical uh, for institutional change programs, which we have been emphasizing with our member organizations and partners. And uh, what we see is that uh, these capacities are really making research and innovation efforts uh, more useful in addressing practical issues. And also to, like in their contribution to, uh, to long-term resilience to help small farmers, but also local and national economies uh, to withstand these unprecedented uh, stressors that we are experiencing recently like COVID and, and the conflicts. Um, and lastly, I would like to also touch upon the enabling environment for innovation. Um, so we have also learned that all the activities that we are doing and the way that we are really integrating these type approaches in our work, uh, we need to address this dimension at the same time as individual and organizational levels. And we have learned that uh, the change in institutional innovation culture really happens when all these three dimensions are, are addressed. But it's not just in terms of capacity development, but also knowledge management, communication, uh, and the overall organizational uh, 
management and leadership. Thank you. Thanks, Martina and Fernando. Thank you, Deji. Well, usually um, one may think that uh, that good entry points are actors, themes, or content areas, geographical, natural regions, and clusters. Uh, but at the beginning, we we didn't know how to begin, so we begin in we began in an organic way. The first one was to try to help people to recognize the difficulties they were facing when working, developing solutions. So we started with training and webinars. And another way we do it was emphasizing the, the country fora. So in real affairs, we believe that it is very important to work with a bottom-up bottom approach as a way to empower the actors at the local level and also to empower the network as a whole. So that's usually how we start everything from the bottom with the country fora. Uh, so we started working with them and we tried to apply this knowledge through these ideas of training webinars, uh, giving them access to the documents, informing about the activities and so on. And in a way, so they can apply this new content to the areas they were already working on, like nutrition, agroecology, IT innovations, youth and gender. So we thought that that would be a, a good way to just to to provide tools, useful tools to improve the way uh, the work that they were already doing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and another thing is that an important value to us, which it may seem kind of very simple, is that uh, the TAP framework uh, is a way to strengthen team building by giving actors appropriate tools to solve problems that, that they face, that they cannot solve. And sometimes people don't see that importance. They don't have the tools, they don't have the, way, the proper ways to utilize those tools. So when you recognize that you cannot uh, attack the problem, solve the problem, when you recognize that there are some tools, there are some uh, a way of thinking what you're doing a different way, it's, it is very strong. So that, I think that that's the important value. The, the, the framework as a whole, as a conceptual model, model it's very powerful uh, to us because it helps us not to think, but to work in the field in a different way. Thank you, Deji. Thank you, Fernando. And um, it, it's very encouraging to hear all, all your points, no? And how, how uh, this has been helping you as a regional organizations to, you know, think differently, navigate through the complexities you have differently, and support your constituencies in differently. And also, uh, Martina, that it's nice that the GRA that we did in all regions actually determined the three main entry points that you can just uh, run with is uh, also very important. And um, and to make institutional changes a long lengthy process, it's, it's a complex process and uh, it entails a lot of things. But I, I do agree that having two thing, two sides in the same uh, sort of uh, parallel, technical and functional capacities in a capacity development approach do, do help and do speed things in a more holistic way. And uh, so, um, we are all together very behind, not because of uh, you in this panel, but uh, we just uh, uh, got behind. Just last two questions. And one uh, I would like to ask Martina, I mean, Apari has been championing uh, on this mainstreaming and integrating up, uh, tools and approaches and framework since long time. And they you have been very much part of an owner of TAP. Uh, process and uh, action plans and implementation. Um, 
I just want to ask you your insight about this, you know, working with APIRAS and working jointly with um, uh, research uh, organization together with extension organizations. You have been working with TAP a long time, but then since recently, since this project, working with APIRAS quite closely, no? Maybe if you can just share some insights and how, how that has, has been influencing your work in APIRAS. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dagi. Um, yeah, I have actually already mentioned some of these areas or some of the insights from the collaboration, but I think what is really important and, and uh, this comes also, this is reflected in our work, uh, joint work that we have been doing in, in the region, is that uh, the framework provides both of us, APARI and uh, APIRAS, uh, with significant opportunities to be creative and to be innovative in, in all our regional activities, the way that we are conducting these activities with our members, with partners and other stakeholders. And also what we have realized uh, uh, kind of mutually is that uh, to promote capacities for innovation, we need to first change ourselves. So we have been really trying to improve uh, not just the way that we work with our teams in our respective organizations, but also among each other and the way that we share knowledge, we engage and we learn from each other. And I think that this is a, this is a huge shift that uh, APARI has been experiencing uh, since for the first time we are working in a, with an extension organization at the, at the regional level. And the second uh, value which I would like to highlight is that uh, uh, we have been tailoring these step approaches, as you mentioned, in a specific context and on specific development themes. And um, while we are promoting, of course, innovations in agriculture, we have realized through this work that what is more important are actually the processes that lead to innovation uh, to, to be created, adopted, and scaled up. So thanks to the framework, uh, we have been focusing more on, in our work on institutional innovation, which means that we have been really trying to influence institutional processes, uh, research and extension institutions, and to develop capacities that enable these organizations um, that we are working with to become more innovative in the way they deliver practical solutions to research and also like by informing you know uh, different agri-food and sectoral policies. So this will be also driving APARI's next strategic plan and of course the work with APIRAS at the regional level on bringing the extension closer to research is going to be part of it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, we have two minutes to wrap up. Do you, um, Abdul Razak and uh, Fernanda, do you guys uh, also, Martina, if you wish, um, any last words uh, you wish to share with the participants and panelists with your uh, regional organizational experience? Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, well, I would like to say something about what you mentioned, the, 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 the Africa a training course and at the beginning we didn't believe that we can say anything interesting and practical effective to our colleagues in Africa but when we started working we realized that the, the, the framework the conceptual framework that we have allow us to move from one country to one specific situation to another specific situation without having those specific situations be a difficulty so the, 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 the framework help us to, to, to pinpoint the most important elements Martina was mentioning processes. So this is what is important is not the details in the process, in the, in the actors, the characteristics, the context, is the processes, how you do the processes considering those factors. So how you do the processes is a very interesting way to talk about the experiences in different regions and different situations. So I think that that's very interesting in terms of the framework and in terms of experiences. So we can systematize and conceptualize those ideas considering the framework. It would be very helpful for all the regions and all the different experiences that we are, we are working on. Thank you, Deji. Thank you, Fernando, for bringing up the interregional collaboration. Yes, yeah, so, so if I may just, just come in here, I, I would say that even, you know, I cannot agree more with uh, Fernando's submission that, that it's a very, very powerful tool, really. We see it even at our own institution here within FARA, for example, we've, we've had reason to apply some of those tools in the way that we navigate the complexities, you know, the political situation. Right now, there's this 
you remember in earlier conversation, I was talking about our ships in terms of donor configuration. Now, those, those ships, they have political uh, dimensions. And so we, we have to look within and see how we can apply those strategies to, to really be able to adjust and be innovative in the way that we, we mobilize resources so that we implement our programs. But beyond that, you know how we say uh, in those numbers that I mentioned, the 459, these are different institutions, sometimes specific programs. Somebody asks a question that uh, he's in Nigeria, but he has never heard of it. But I can tell them, and I even posted that the answer to the question. Right now, we're dealing with 13 institutions in Nigeria uh, around strengthening capacities. And in each of those, those institutions, we conducted a capacity audit using the top tools. You need to understand what, uh, what, is, what is missing, what are the gaps, you know, and support them and help them to not just have the technical capacities, but have those functional, the four plus one capacities. And uh, we, we really, uh, I really agree with Fernando that it's a very powerful thing that we need to do more and really move uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And all three of you, interest of time, I will quickly uh, wrap it up. And this is only a three out of six organizations that have been, uh, you know, part of this process. And there is more stories to be said. And Viviana is a very instrumental individual in Latin America and part of this um, implementation of this uh, work in the Latin America region in which we hope to expand to other regions as well. So I'm sure she will uh, bring some of the work in her following panel discussion. Um, so thank you so much, Martina, Abdul Razak, Fernando. Uh, it's been great chatting with you in, through this panel and uh, looking forward to continue the good work. Thank you so much. I'll, thank you for having thank us. Thank you. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. So I'll pass it over to my colleague, Nivena Alexandrova, who will be moderating the next uh, panel. Thank you very much, Deggy, and thank you to the previous panel for the very interesting insights regarding the uh, strengthening capacity development for agriculture innovation systems. In this panel now, we are going to address the enablers, the evidence-based policies and investments for on agriculture innovation. Because as we know, uh, if the best, um, even we have the best capacity development framework, the best process designed, if we don't have um, conducive policies and investments, the likelihood to succeed is, um, um, uh, is decreasing rapidly. So uh, with that uh, said, I would like to ask the previous panel members to switch off their cameras and the new panel members to switch on the cameras. And we have Viviana Palmieri with us, we have Louis-Marie Cacteau, and we also have Helena, Helena, could you please switch off your switch on your camera? Um, I am going in order to save time. Will pass uh, the uh, the bios of the speakers, and I'm not going to present them. However, I will show a slide if you allow me to. Um, slide with the questions that we are going to address in this panel. The first question is, what experiences on evidence-based policies and investments are out there? Can you recommend one good practice that is based on your experience? I will read the second and the third questions, and then I will give the floor to all three panelists for the first question, for which they can have uh, slides if they wish to. So naturally, the next question that we are going to explore is what capacities are needed? We are talking about mainstreaming capacity development for agriculture. I, yeah, yeah. So what capacities are needed, particularly in the country context, to um, shape evidence-based policies and investments on uh, AIS? And how to strengthen those capacities? 
capacities that are related to the enablers. And the third question, hopefully we'll have time, but it's an important one. What is the role of the TAP in the mainstreaming of those capacities, policies, and investments for AIS? So I'll stop uh, sharing my screen, and I would like to give the floor to Viviana Palmieri for her intervention on the first question. Thank you. Hello, Levena. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, really, public policies are not my strength, but uh, uh, I think that based on the experiences that we have in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, I wanted to share some things. In general, not only for innovation policies, but in general, there are very few examples that of countries that can really base their policy design, policy design on evidence. In Latin America and the Caribbean, it's just a handful of countries that really have in place monitoring and evaluation systems with policies that allow them to base their policy making on the, the, the real evidence. Uh, only Mexico, Colombia, and Chile, and that's it. Uruguay, for example, has been trying for a long time to set in place such a system, but really uh, many times for political reasons, it's not feasible. Uh, nobody really wants to be evaluated. So the monitoring and evaluation systems uh, are not very popular with the people that should uh, give the data to the systems. Uh, However, many uh, countries do base their policy making a little bit on, on, on evidence. Uh, sometimes comparing what has happened elsewhere. Uh, for example, in uh, Uruguay, planning for changes at the ministry level, the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, they have studied the changes that happened in Australia and New Zealand. So there is uh, a tendency to uh, use evidence more and more, but it's not necessarily explicit or it, it isn't systematized. It isn't part of the institutional framework. Uh, then there's some work, for example, with, uh, from the Inter-American Development Bank with AgriMonitor, that's a system for, uh, and it, it showed that uh, allocating budgets to general services and public goods is much more effective than allocating funds to private efforts. Uh, there are other evidence gathering efforts done internationally, like the one, the work that Swedish 2030 did. They carried out a, a huge a study to gather evidence on which incentives really lead to good practices and that have favorable uh, results in terms of productivity, profitability, and sustainability. So there are efforts, it's not really systematized. Uh, in, in more closer, closer to home, uh, the three CDIs projects that happened in Central America really showed that the strengthening of functional capacities could increase the chance of innovation uh, from the local level within the system. Uh, this should be really an integral part of the, the projects. Should be really uh, enhanced in each project to be able to uh, go from the recommendations to real changes at an institutional country level. Uh, as to good practices, maybe the joint planning and monitoring of activities in the agriculture innovation system is is one that uh, really brings better results. Uh, but in general, gathering good evidence in a systematic way, effective monitoring and evaluation, and good communication for awareness raising and advocacy, I think are key. Thank you. That would be for my first question. Thank you very much, Viviana. And may I invite uh, now um, uh, Louis? 
please, for your intervention. Thank you. I don't know if you you can hear me. Um, the only experience I would like to share here is uh, um, the financial inclusion through renegotiation recognizing recognition of uh, consumer land uh, rights. Uh, because for the moment, for most farmers in our environment, um, they are excluded from the financial system and they are unable to make large care investment. So um, some are also unable to upgrade your farm or to increase their productivity. And the idea is to recognize their land because they, they are land owners but the state in most of our West and Eastern Africa do not yet recognize their property. And it, if it was so, uh, it would be interested to integrate them in the financial system in order to obtain uh, like possibilities to uh, leverage the money necessary to invest or to make large care investment. Uh, this really, the, the idea, just to give you an example from Cameroon, uh, it is necessary to pay around 2,000 US dollars to obtain a land title uh, on a scale, on a space of uh, something like just 1,000 square meters. It's, it's, it's too big for this space, you know? And uh, most farmer cannot, um, cannot afford this. And uh, it will be much more interesting to recognize their, their land, their customary rights to give them uh, possibility to, to invest and to have to upgrade your farm and to have much more uh, much more productivity in in our context um, i know that uh, in some country like uganda the recognition has been done but uh, the debate is all about mortgaging a uh, part of uh, of the land it is still forbidden but uh, the discussions are uh, are, are going on and it will be interesting uh, to have everything recognized uh, for farmers to uh, easily uh, to e easily invest. So this is uh, the first experience that I can share uh, from uh, what we have uh, around us now. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, may I invite now Helena, please? Yes, thank you, uh, Nevena. Um, I did prepare a few slides because it will help me explain a little bit, I think, on my experience. Um, I prefer to, to talk about our own experience because, of, of course, there are many experiences out there, but it's always best to talk about your own. Um, so I want to say a little bit about Desira Lift, um, which is a service facility, and it's, it's linked to Desira. So some of what I'm saying will um, link to what previous speakers have been talking about, because we're all part of the same this year family. But before I say a bit more about um, what we do as this year lift and how that links to, to your question, Evina, um, I think we, we are trying to build on the lessons from previous projects. So an important uh, project for us has been the CDAS project that was implemented by Agrinatura members, but there was also many of the lessons and insights from that are integrated in a top common framework already mentioned. Um, already mentioned also by various speakers is the importance to focus on functional capacities to strengthen that of the various actors in agricultural innovation systems. And the other one also already mentioned, I think by Martina, the triple pathway approach, where you try to work 
at multiple levels at the same time. So at micro level, um, working with smaller consortia, research partnerships, um, or innovation partnerships that try to address a specific problem in a specific area. At MISO level, try to strengthen the ecosystem of, we call them innovation support services, but basically these are stakeholders in your system, can be NGOs, can be extension workers, um, can be private sector, that are certain enablers also in the system to make things happen, to make things change. And lastly, at macro level, to build an enabling environment for um, innovation through policies and instruments. So those were important lessons that we took on board when um, the DCRA program of European Commission and the DCRA lift that supports the program were designed in past years. So here also under the DCRA program, um, there is funding and support on the three areas that sort of link to those three pathways. So one is supporting over 70 research and innovation projects that are implemented by multi-stakeholder consortia. Um, secondly, um, supporting the research architecture, architecture that's there, and particularly we focus here in Africa and Farah and Abdul Razak are also involved in this, to make it conducive to innovation. And thirdly, knowledge and evidence to feed policy design. Um, and the Zero Lift is providing support services in each of these areas. So I heard you say, Nevena, talk to the enablers, but we feel more we try to support the enablers. So we are supporting enablers and uh, cheering them on. But most of all, we try to provide trainings, uh, learning events, peer-to-peer -peer learning, so we can all learn and exchange and uh, become better at this. So that is our experience in that sense, that we take the evidence coming from, from previous project programs to build on that in this larger program and initiative that's funded by the European Commission. So through those three pillars, we, we try to work on those different uh, parts that, that we said need to shift and change and improve to trigger innovation. Um, enhancing capacities within the national agricultural innovation systems that are really that are really the enablers that implement and scale innovations. Um, at the same time, work towards a more effective um, and demand-driven public policies on research and extension. And here, the role from organizations such as FARA um, are crucial. Also, the SROs and AFAS that is represented by Max. And we work with European and African policymakers also to look at what is the, the policy environment. Um, I want to already skip ahead a little bit in a discussion because a lot of it that we do in the Zero Lift is, is reflecting on capacities, what capacities are needed, but then also to provide support to strengthen those capacities. And one thing I wanted to mention is um, at the moment, we are particularly working towards a program to strengthen the capacities of the partners that are implementing some of those research projects under this era. And five capacities that we identified that are crucial is, um, so this is in addition to functional capacities that were mentioned before. This is really, if you have an action research project, which capacities do the project partners really need to engage with other actors that can enable change, that can enable the scaling of innovation. Um, it was already mentioned by the previous uh, in the previous panel of speakers, the need to, to monitor, to reflect, to learn, and to, to be accountable, but also to learn and, and adjust your own ways of working or your, in your organization. Um, the capacity to manage open innovation processes is another one that we are looking into and try to strengthen. Um, and that is really open innovation is to say, also include actors beyond your own consortium or organization to be open to, to innovation that includes other stakeholders. Capacities to adapt and respond to innovation needs. Um, so we really need adaptive project management in that. 
And innovation needs are actually, in the current context, can change very rapidly because we have lots of uncertainties in the world at the moment. Um, we are all aware of the multiple crises that we're facing that also has uh, an effect on what is actually the need and the social demand. Capacities to influence the project environment, uh, strengthen other actors in the national agricultural innovation systems. And of course, the TAP AIS project is also working on this, so we also learn from them. Capacities to collaborate in multi-actor innovation facilities. So these are capacities we focus on in the research projects because we recognize that as researchers, we also have a, a changing role in, in innovation. And this morning we had um, also a session, a side event, where we reflected on how can the research partnerships work for national agricultural innovation system strengthening. And some of the key messages that came out of that um, is we need, and I think many of these and you will recognize, but we need long-term partnerships between research society and policy actors to, to build trust, to understand each other, to move towards a common agenda. Um, we also need to recognize that each actor has its role and its mandate, and we need to support each other in that and strengthen each other in those roles. Um, this could be, for example, a power farmers or recognize their roles as leaders also and other actors in the partnerships um, that we create. Already said, but very important capacity, you need to continuously reflect, learn and adapt and share what we learn. Um, I heard Martina say telling our story. I heard Abdul Razak talk about Farah being training uh, many other actors. We need to, to share with each other, what did we learn? How does this work? Um, we talked this morning about researchers are not only knowledge providers, but more than that, we have a role, we have a role to play as researchers. I'm talking now on behalf of research community, um, but not only just produce knowledge and give that to others. We also need to acknowledge we're part of a wider system that produces knowledge. And at the same time, we need to focus more on transdisciplinary approaches where research works with other actors to develop new knowledge and uh, new insights. It's also important to, to be aligned with social and public demand. So whenever we talk about um, what experience or what are good practices or capacities that are needed to um, advance investments in, in agricultural innovation systems, for example, it only works if we are aligned with the policy agendas, with the social demand, with the public demand. So we need to be also very much aware of what is the need of society. And we need to question or, or think for ourselves also, okay, if we talk about strengthening agricultural innovation systems or capacities for innovation, for what purpose to achieve what mission? Um, and lastly, we talked this morning about we should shift when we talk about governing bodies for research, we should shift our focus from research to agricultural innovation systems. So also includes other actors uh, linked to extension, farmer representative, private sector, and strengthen the nodes to so strengthen the capacities of each actor and strengthen the linkages between actors. This is what I wanted to share. Um, for now about our experiences. Thank you very much, uh, Helena, for the very rich um, uh, presentation. So, so far, what we heard uh, from the panelists today on the first question was that uh, evidence-based policies are emerging, but still are not norm especially in the Latin American context, but from experiences, we know that is um, a general trend. Um, monitoring and evaluation methodologies have been mentioned several times, uh, also in the context that um, still policymakers are reluctant to um, perform policies based on monitoring and, and evaluation. Uh, that is also obliging, obliging in um, um, 
showing the progress of the implementation. However, um, those mechanisms are emerging and even a, a good practice that has been mentioned was uh, one that the, the joint monitoring and evaluation performed in the um, framework of the, the project, uh, TAP AIS. We also heard about one uh, concrete good practice, um, and this is to bring farmers into the rudder of the policies and investments uh, in, in the example provided by Luis. And uh, from um, uh, Helena, uh, we uh, heard uh, their specific approach. The good practice that they have is actually to uh, capitalize on uh, what has been already done in uh, previous projects to uh, shape uh, the, the, the zero lift in particular, and also um, enable enablers, as uh, she said. Um, she um, presented a, a, a great slide on the capacities that are, are needed for policies and investments um, in general. Monitoring and evaluation was one of them. Uh, open innovation, responding to the needs, operationalization of agriculture innovation systems, and uh, collaborate in uh, multi-actor um, innovation um, approaches, partnerships, facilities, as she called them. I cannot agree more with uh, what has been said, um, also from experiences that are outside of the TAP uh, AAS project. Um, what I also find um, pertinent is the capacity for participatory policy uh, formulation. Uh, but I would like to hear with one word from uh, Viviana and uh, Louis, do you have anything particular to add on the capacities? Oh, uh, we jump to the third question. Viviana? Sorry, so we're moving to the third question. No, uh, if, no you, okay. if you want to make a point of capacities, you are, yes. that's your moment. Okay, I think that uh, all collective policy stakeholder efforts to advocate for and shape policies are more effective than any single type of actors trying to push forward the agenda. So all the capacities that enhance collaborations and the capacity to negotiate, I think they are key. The capacity to comprehend and navigate the, the complex systems is, is very important because you need some way to gather the evidence and a better comprehension of the context allows you to focus on the key indicators for the uh, success or not of different uh, efforts or policies or uh, projects. Um, maybe the, 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 this gathering of evidence to be able to uh, modify policies and put in place a better understanding of how innovation works and how multi-stakeholder uh, efforts are better than than any other thing that we have tried in the past. Uh, I think it's very important to acquire the technical and functional capacities that allow good monitoring, evaluation, and learning from the experiences. And you also need financial capacities, so the funding to get it done. Working together is not free. It takes time, it, gets, it takes money, and understanding the, the, the context and being able to uh, monitor and evaluate the changes that are happening and, and shape innovation policies accordingly. It takes money because it takes time and takes effort and it takes specific financial capacities. Thank you very much uh, for pointing out the collaboration. Um, also, uh, the financial capacities, uh, uh, 
documenting and uh, analyzing data evidence as well in the general uh, functional and also technical capacities. Luis, do you have anything to add on the capacities? Yes, um, in our context, agriculture is still informal. And uh, if we really want to boost something, we need to build the business capacity of farmers. Uh, to be able to move uh, from, farm, from family farms to business farms. Uh, for the moment, it is an issue. And it is necessary to straighten even at the civil servants level, uh, the land policy capacity also. Uh, for the moment, it is formulated that land still belong to the state and it is necessary to formulate it in the way that lands belong to local people and the land tenure policy is to maybe adjust it to be adjusted in our environment to really help the uh, uh, lo help local investment and all other kind of uh, I have seen a sort of a mutation where we can call even uh, rebranding agriculture in our environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louis. Actually, um, what you pointed out now is the coherence between uh, policies on uh, agriculture innovation and land tenure. And in, and, uh, general coherence of policies and investments, it's uh, very pertinent for agriculture innovation um, because it saves resources and efforts, um, but it's not so easy thing to do. Um, by the way, um, FAO and IFPRI are organizing specific webinar uh, within the Science and Innovation Forum tomorrow at four o'clock um, uh, Central European time for those who would like to know more. And now I would like to pass to the third question uh, very quickly. And this is about the role of the TAP in um, um, in streaming capacities, policies, and investments for agriculture innovation systems. I would like to give the floor to Helena. Um, thank you, Nevena. Um, yeah, I find it not an easy question to answer because mainstreaming capacity policy and investments of course, each context is uh, is different in terms of um, institutional context, um, infrastructure, political environment, social needs, public demand. Um, so there's not one approach. Um, I think that are, are one one strategy. But I think in all cases um, we need to be in constant dialogue and advocacy with all the stakeholders involved. So what can TAP do? For me, I think um, as a platform, it would be really helpful to capture successes and lessons from previous and ongoing projects and programs to showcase that to the policymakers and other actors on how innovation can be fostered, how more impact can be achieved. So this may vary from one context to another, um, what has been the entry point, what has been a success factor. But capturing those lessons, telling the story, as we heard earlier on, from real cases, um, I think will be very useful um, to promote this, this thinking further and to also help other policymakers or other actors to understand what could work in their context. Thank you very much, um, Louis or Viviana? Well, I could start. Uh, I think TAP has already uh, helped a lot to try to develop the capacities that can allow the mainstream, the policies and the investments, but there's an opportunity to work a lot more on the how to do that. Uh, in the Latin American 
in Caribbean region, as Fernando was telling us earlier, we been we were working the past two years. Uh, and last year, in a joint effort by Renacer, ICA, and CIICA to bring on board the Coraima stakeholders, uh, we did a training of trainers and produced a guide on the how to develop capacities in Spanish. That's a start. But there's a, a lot of opportunities to enhance those efforts. And the, the role for TAP, uh, I think great emphasis must be placed on communication and advocacy activities within each project to be able to advance from recommendations and lessons learned at the end of each effort to uh, such as I mentioned for the CDIS initiatives in Central America, but to bring about real changes in the institutional framework. Uh, to be able to mainstream, there has to be, I think, a specific effort to include this, these activities from the beginning of each of the projects uh, in which TAP participates. Uh, there's also a very important role for TAP that has already started uh, in the international sharing of tools and approaches. Last year, or at the beginning of this year, uh, there was a quite successful collaboration, I think, uh, from Asian and Latin America and the Caribbean regional organizations to the organization of the uh, African uh, training of trainers. That, that was great. But there are many other things that, for example, to learn from a family how they improve the way of telling their story uh, that Nancy Martina mentioned earlier, or the mainstreaming of the that common framework in many institutions in Africa that was mentioned by the colleague in, in FARA. I think we can all learn from these and getting to pinpoint exactly what went right, what left, what worked to be able to bring about those changes. Thank you. Thank you. So what I heard from uh, both of you uh, is that TAP will be very and is already very instrumental in um, uh, collecting success stories and lessons learned and then present them uh, to the policy makers um, so that uh, to ensure that uh, those stories can make an impact in a specific context. In other terms that we have to promote uh, for the communication and, and advocacy uh, in order to make real changes um, in the institutional frameworks and um, provide a clear guidance on how to do these changes um, in different contexts. And the point of the interregional collaboration and the, um, that uh, TAP is uh, very instrumental to uh, was also raised. If we doesn't have any other point to make. I would like to thank to the uh, panel uh, for the great elaborations and uh, close this uh, panel session and pass the floor um, to Guido for the final uh, and concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Nevena. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all the panelists, uh, the presenters, the moderators, uh, as well as Max Soloport and uh, uh, Ramazami uh, Salvaraggio and Christophe Larose, who uh, opened this uh, uh, side event. I would say it, it has been a very dense uh, side event with many concepts being presented by the different uh, panelists. So it's going to be quite difficult for me to uh, to summarize and but but I will try to to at least uh, to draw some conclusions on the discussion that have been uh, uh, made so far. Uh, first of all, the general message is that bringing innovation in the cultural systems is not an easy task, and innovation is not adopted per se just by being innovative or even just by being uh, beneficial to farmers or to the economic system. Uh, in a gen from a general point of view. I must highlight uh, uh, working in, in Italy, I mean in, in Europe, that the same happens uh, here in this country, in this continent, uh, 
uh, where we have an over-regulated agricultural system and where farmers have uh, abundant, I would say even in excess, access to any possible source of information and advice and technical advice. And uh, uh, the same happens uh, here. It happens everywhere in the world. And it is an issue that, that must be uh, tackled by researchers, by advisory services, and by the uh, policy uh, sector in general. Uh, during this workshop, we uh, had presentation on a very few interesting things. First of all, there are a number of different approaches, and we, we had a presentation of some of them from webinars to communities of practices to dis distance learnings, or even to more traditional uh, meetings and uh, media. Second, and I think by far more important, is that regional organizations can do a valuable work in this context. We got messages in this direction from representatives of, from FARA, PARI, and from the Latin American network uh, with their experiences. And they all enhance, although in different ways, the catalytic effect that a regional organization can have in promoting agricultural innovation systems. And specifically, and hopefully I would say, the CDI's uh, uh, system developed within the TAP and within FA. However, uh, capacities uh, to, to enhance capacities, need, need just to say, you need uh, money, uh, you need funds, and uh, in a more general way, you need uh, what we call institutional framework or governance system. Again, an innovation uh, per se uh, by itself is not uh, a winning innovation. Which means, uh, uh, I mean, we, we all know, uh, I mean, all the, and, and we had, uh, by the way, uh, uh, a very interesting presentation during the Agriculture Congress this uh, May this year in Ireland. We know that every euro or dollar spent in research is uh, multiplied by 10 when adopted by, by farms. So it's, it's very important to, uh, to get funds, to get money for research, uh, and uh, to have uh, to improve uh, research systems in the area of the world. But this by uh, itself is not enough. And uh, from the panelists in the second session, we got, I would say, different, uh, a different set of messages, all of them very interesting. First of all, I like very much the distinction between the micro, the meso, and the macro level in innovation systems, and all, all of which are important, uh, which means that, uh, uh, of course, it is important. Uh, the, the, the role of farmers themselves is important, but also there is a very important role by innovation support services, and an even more uh, important part that can be done by uh, at, at, at the policy level. Uh, I liked also very much, and I think that this is a message from this, from this meeting, uh, uh, the fact that we have to be, I mean, we all, all of us, uh, uh, we have to be very open and adaptive. And, and, and both these uh, concepts, uh, although uh, shared by everybody of us, I would say it, it's very difficult to apply them in practice being open to innovation, open to changes and, and adaptive to, to changes are not uh, easy tasks, but this is part of, uh, it, it's a very important part of an agricultural innovation system. And uh, uh, we must be aware that uh, monitoring and evaluation and learning are key, are key issues. And again, in terms of funding, we must be ready to the fact that all every dollar or every euro that is spent in uh, agricultural innovation systems has to be evaluated, has to be monitored uh, at, at, at least at the policy at the policy level. Uh, another key issue is long-term 
partnerships between research actors and policy actors and farmers are important and it's very difficult uh, also in, in our situation is establish to, to establish such long-term partnerships and i think that policy makers have a very important role in these aspects and uh, I would, I liked also very much the statement made on uh, uh, access to land, on land tenure, and uh, also on the importance of uh, creating business capacity of farmers. Uh, again, a key issue, farmers are business actors. Uh, they, they are not a non-for-profit organization. They, they are there to make their own business and they, they must uh, know how to make their, uh, the, the best business for their uh, piece of land, for their farm, for their tenants. Um, now, in this uh, uh, context, I think that uh, uh, the TAP as a platform uh, can have a very important role uh, in the future. And uh, so I, my, my final message is stay tuned on future initiatives uh, from the top in this uh, area. And uh, I think that there is a lot of work to be done in the future, but I hope that, that we will uh, bring uh, uh, successful initiatives uh, in this area. Thank you.